Good evening, Church. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back here again with you this time, the second time. Uh, thank you, Pastor Barrett, Derek, for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I was told that you're on a series about identity, and so I thought I'd like to continue with this uh, strand about what it means to know our identity in Christ, and what does that mean with regards to our destiny in Him. So I entitled this uh, afternoon's message called His Image, My Identity and My Destiny. Now, most of us are quite familiar with this uh, passage from Psalms 139. I didn't come from a Christian background. In fact, I came from uh, my family faith. And uh, when I became a Christian, uh, it was a very dramatic time for me. Uh, I thought I would like to share with you a little bit. This picture is a picture when I was, uh, when I was a baby. And this is the only photo that I have of myself. You see, I grew up in a Mandarin-speaking family. Uh, whereby um, we all commun communicate in Chinese or even in our, in our dialect, uh, Hakka. But I went to uh, ACS, whereby um, it's, a, it's a school whereby they pride themselves in English and most people fail Chinese. I'm the opposite. I'm the A1 student for Chinese. I'm the F9 student when it comes to English. And therefore, throughout my school days in ACS, I struggled through and I wrestled through. In fact, uh, every year in my primary and my secondary school, uh, I was always in the last class. I don't know whether if any of you have always been like this, always in the last class. I was always in the, in the last class. And it didn't help that uh, I'm, I'm more conversant in Mandarin. I'm very comfortable in Mandarin, but when it comes to English, I tend to be a little bit shy. So therefore, I have very few friends that will hang out with me. And uh, not only that, I was uh, underweight, I'm, I'm still underweight, I was underweight and uh, I, don't, I, I didn't play sports. Now the reason why I've never played soccer before is because no one invited me to play a soccer. So therefore Chinese speaking, underweight, didn't do well academically and I was kind of like really left behind. And uh, on top of that, uh, I came from a, from a very simple and poor background and therefore in the ACS environment where most of the classmates I'm from a wealthy setting, it was very challenging for me. So growing up in ACS, uh, I hardly had friends. Uh, I pulled through uh, my, my primary school, got into secondary school in ACS, and throughout my secondary school days, uh, it was increasingly very difficult for me. Uh, I, uh, CCA, when it comes to joining a, a, a club, uh, I, I didn't get into any of the sports. Uh, I wasn't chosen for any uniform group. So what do you do? Uh, so I joined the Chinese society. And uh, so in doing my time in ACS, um, only weird people joined Chinese society, you know. And then also, um, I was in the school choir, and my time, okay, this is my time. Uh, during my time, only those CC joined school choir. So I got rubber stamped, you know, in my, in my, in my school days, belonging to a certain club of people that laughed at, that's been joked at, and stuff like that. When I hit secondary four, uh, there was a major crisis that happened in my family, and this is a year, um, a month before my GC O level exams. Uh, I was really struggling through. Okay, this is a month before my O levels exams. Uh, there was a fight that happened between my aunt and my mom, and during that fight, my aunt leaked out a secret that I was not supposed to know. My aunt uh, told told me uh, I was th I was there uh, that I I was purchased by the family. Uh, that I didn't belong to this family, that I was adopted uh, by sale into this family. And my parents didn't want to acknowledge that. But I somehow knew that that was true uh, because uh, there were two birth certificates that, that, I, that I know about. And so, what do you do? You know, at the age of 16 years old, the family that you thought that you belonged to turned out to be not your actual biological family. And... Uh, you fail, so I failed my old levels exams that, that year, and you had to repeat. And so my whole identity, my whole image of how I see myself was totally lost. It was just a very terrible time of not knowing where I belong and who am I. In my repeated year, I uh, was looking for a place to belong. I was looking for people that I could belong to. So I, I had a friend in my repeated year, that taught me every bad thing that I've ever learned in my life. And, uh, and the guy introduced me to a group of friends uh, outside of the school, whereby they all accepted me. 
they all just welcomed me. Now, of course, I didn't know that that group of friends, uh, they belonged to a certain gang, you know, but I just joined them and they just welcomed me. They, they protected me from all the stuff that they were doing, but they included me in many of the events and activities. And that's where in that one year, I, I did every bad thing that I've ever done in my life, I did it in that year. I was, I was being taught by that. And so in that year, um, I, the, my, my group of friends, they, 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 they sin very hard, uh, but they also study very hard. So it's a little bit strange. We will skip school to study. And so, so I, would, I would skip school with them. And because my Mandarin was really good, I'll be doing the homework and they will be doing my homework. And we would help each other. In that year, surprise, I did very well for my repeated O-Levels exams. Uh, I, I scored A1 for my Chinese, A1 for my math. I passed science, literature, history, geography. I only failed one subject and that was English. And I remember uh, failing English for the second time and therefore I could not go to anywhere, not Polytechnic, not ACJC, not any other JC at all. I remember walking down the slope from Bakarut Methodist Church and feeling totally sense of despair, lost, and not knowing what to do. Who the heck am I? Where do I belong? Just all these angry languages that was going on inside of me. Um, me and my friends, we went down to Fais Plaza. On the basement of Fais Plaza, I remember I popped 25 pills. Within 15 minutes, I was foaming. And my friend realized that I had tried to attempt suicide, use his finger, to tickle my throat and I threw out everything. Slap on my back and he said to me, don't do this stupid thing again, you'll be fine. And that's where the whole group parted. From that point onwards, I was totally lost. I, I, I didn't know where I, I should go. I did not know where I belong. And I did not know what I should do next. Uh, I was assigned to an IT. Uh, I didn't like the uniform because it was brown. <laughs> and I just didn't like to wear brown. So, so I didn't go to school. I went to sign up in a private school, uh, A-Levels, and then I went to work in Daimaru. Uh, when I worked in Daimaru, because family was such a difficult place to be, with, to be in, so I was either, either in school or I'm in Daimaru working or I'm just hanging around on the streets of Orchard Road. I'm one of those uh, Burger King and McDonald's kid at Fires Plaza. And so, so I was hanging around on the streets and just walking around and, and working and studying at the same time. And I did that for more than a year, just feeling totally despair, feeling totally lost, not doing well, and just gone, just totally gone. And in my, a, year, a year into that, uh, I, met, I met my friend, this friend who taught me every bad thing that I learned in my life you know, in, when I was in secondary school. He invited me to a Mandarin hotel. And I thought he was inviting me to go to the club where we used to go to for, uh, for dancing. And so he brought me up to the ballroom. I remember walking into the ballroom, talk, thinking to myself, wow, this club has moved from the basement to the ballroom. So cool, right? And so I walk into the ballroom and I saw thousands of chairs. And I thought to myself, why does this club have so many chairs? Anyway, the band was rehearsing. There was a live band on stage. And I thought, this is so cool. This club has got a live band. Let's check out the dance floor, right? And so I walked to the front. It was a long strip of space in the front. And then with owl, and then an owl, and then an owl. You must understand, up to the point, I've never been to a church. So this is the first time I'm stepping into a Christian environment. And so when the lights turn on, I see all the banners and all the decor that says about Jesus, about God, about Jehovah. I look at my friend, I'm like, what happened to you? And he said to me, well, after I left school, I became a Christian. And I've been praying for you because I taught you every bad thing that you've ever done in your life. I thought I'd better save you. And he found me that day. So, so he said, would you stay? So yeah, I, would, I had nowhere to go. So I, so I kind of like stayed. Uh, music came on. Everybody was jumping up and down. I jumped up and down together with them. Why? Because in the club, we do the same thing too. And so I was jumping up and down. And then the music died down. And then the lights come on. It came on. The colorful lights came on. And everybody was just raising their hands. They were singing praises to God. You know what? In the club, we also raise hands. So I raised my hands together with them. We're just singing, just enjoying in there. And I was just thinking, wow, this is quite cool, man. And then I, I saw these people crying. I was like, why are they crying when they're singing slow songs about love, loving Jesus and loving God? You see, in the club, 
when you sing love songs and you cry, it's because you broke up with your girlfriend. So I thought, wow, many people here broke up with Jesus. That's really sad, but never mind. So, so music ended, we all sat down. I mean, okay, we all sat down. The preacher came up. The preacher came from Texas, USA. I did not understand a single English word that he said because his Texan accent was so strong. And, and so I, f- I fell asleep. A typical atheist boy, chapel period, you sleep, right? So I fell asleep. And then, uh, then, then, then when he said, let us pray. Uh, so I learned in this year, when the preacher says, let us pray, it means it's time to wake up. And so I, I got up and then he sat down and then the worship leader came back up again. His name was called Don Moen. He sang this beautiful song called I'll Exhort Thee. While he was singing that song, the entire auditorium broke up into a six-part harmony. I was like, this is so cool. What beautiful voices are these? Then all of a sudden, I saw something flash across the ceiling that says, For God so loved Chin Lun that he gave Chin Lun his only son. If Chin Lun believes in him, he will not die but have everlasting life. I thought to myself, Xiao Liao, I'm not a Christian. Why do I suddenly see this kind of stuff? And all of a sudden, I had this sense that God knows my name. And I cannot explain to you why. In the middle of looking at that thing in the ceiling, I suddenly saw in my memory bank the day that I was sold as a baby. I wept and I wept and I wept because for two years since I was 16, no one would talk to me about the incident. But somehow God knew where I had come from. So that's where I became a Christian. And after I became a Christian, I begin to study into the scriptures. I begin to love the word of God. I begin to allow God's word to tutor me. You see, up to that point in time, I thought my life was going to be totally wasted. I thought I was just going to be a gang member. I thought I was just going to be ended up in prison and doing all kinds of stuff. But somehow God met me and he introduced something new to me. He introduced himself to me. He began to talk to me about who he is. And I first of all, one of the earliest passages that I studied was Psalms 139. Looking into the passage that says that I was fearfully and wonderfully made. My head could not wrap around this because up to that point, I did not like myself. I did not like who, who I was. I did not like where I came from. I did not like what I didn't have. And therefore, I didn't like it. And so when God says I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that he has a book, and in the book consists of all the days ordained for me were written in the book. I begin to discover that being made in the image of God is something that's so wonderful. And as I study into Psalms 139, I begin to realize this. When God made me, he looked at himself. He looked at who he is. And then he formed me and he shaped me in accordance to the image of who he is. And because of that, something switched. Something turned on inside of me. I began to dive deep into studying the image of God. I begin to realize that the more I know who God is, the more I know who, who I am. So I enter into what we call a friendship with God. And one of the earliest things that I was taught is to study God's character. I'm going to show you a chart. On this chart is something that's very interesting. This chart is actually my my own quiet time. On the left hand consists of God's nature. That is a list of who God is that I can never be. He is invisible. No matter how holy and how much I pray, I can never be invisible. He is all perfect memory, perfect imagination. I am not. He is all-knowing, He is all-present, I am not. No matter how holy I am, I can never be that expect about who God is. That belongs to Him, and when I see Him in that way, I bow down in reverence of who He is. The middle column is God's character. That is who God is, that He asked me to be like Him. The right-hand column is God's expression. That's what God do with who He is. And He says this, When you know me, His character you will find how I express and you will find your destiny, God's expression. And so I begin to dive myself to discover and to understand 
the nature and the character of God. And as I begin to encounter God's character, that He's redemptive, that He's restorative, that He is loving, He's kind, He's good, He's shalom, and every single one of His character, He has an expression. He has a destiny that's tied to His character in there. And I begin to dive in, and the more I study about God, the more I encounter about who God is, I begin to discover who I am in the process, in the, in the time of just beginning to gradually learn to accept who I am and to even learn to love who I am. It took me a long time. It did not happen overnight. It took me a long journey of learning to love who I am because I no longer look at myself from the mirror image. I look at, learn to look at myself from the way that God sees me. And one of the scriptures that I learned when I was very young in the New Believer is Isaiah 46, verses 10 to 11. Maybe you want to read together with me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I said, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I pleased. From the east, I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, there would I bring about, what I've planned, there would I do. This scripture tells me that God has a billion pieces of jigsaw puzzle. He sees the end from the beginning. And that in the billion pieces of jigsaw puzzle, it consists of all that he desires to do. And then he summons a man. And when he calls a man, he gives that man 20 pieces of jigsaw puzzle. For example, he calls me, he gives me 20 pieces of jigsaw puzzle. And then he calls Nicholas. He gives Nicholas 20 pieces of jigsaw puzzle. And as I begin to, to put my puzzles together, I realize that 10 pieces make sense, 5 pieces make sense, the other 5 are random. But as Nick examples his 20 pieces of jigsaw puzzle, he realizes that 15 pieces make sense, 5 pieces are random. So on our own, we have some, but others don't make sense until I meet Nick. Then I begin to realize that my random pieces fits into his 15, his random pieces fits into my 5, and as we come together, we realize, hey, we see a little bit more now. Then we meet other people, and we realize that as we connect together, we form the big picture. So I learned and from my early Christian days that the question is not what is God's will for my life, but rather, what is God's big picture and where do I fit into God's big picture? The question is not what is God's will for my life as if that this is a whole and it stand alone. No, I fit into the bigger picture of God. That is a very important step to my early days in my discipleship. The other scripture that really got hold of me is this scripture on Habakkuk 2.14 very popular scripture about the earth filled with God's glory as the waters cover the sea. I realize that this is one passion that I have, that I long to see the whole earth to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. And what is the glory of God? Now, I learned from very young days that the glory of God is the character of God. God's longing is to see the earth, whether is it nations or towns or cities or neighborhoods or families, to be filled with His character in them. So I grew up in my discipleship, learning to love God's Word, learning to study God's character, and in that process, learning to realize that what, what God has called me to do. So what happened? I went to the army shortly after I became a Christian, and uh, I, did, I really enjoyed my army days. I, I thoroughly enjoyed my, my time uh, in the army, and, and I really shined like a light for Jesus when I was there. Came out from the army. I, I'm, very, I'm very good with math and, 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 with, and with numbers. And so when I came out from the army, I, I went to work in an auditing company and, uh, as, a, as a clerk. But, but because of my flair with audit, I, I began to grow. I, I got promoted very quickly. And within a short span of time, I was promoted to become an audit assistant and I was auditing different smaller companies in there. And my boss called me into his office one day and uh, he gave me a surprise. He offered me a scholarship to go to UK to study. It's a four-year scholarship to do my basic learning on accountancy, moving on to a full degree with the ACCA. He said to me, if you were to do this full-time, you can complete this in four years, and I'm giving it to you as a gift with no contract. No contract. I was 21 years old. I was so happy, and I was so 
excited that God has blessed me with this wonderful thing. And as I begin to pray about going to UK, something in me just didn't sit well inside my heart and I couldn't understand why. And I begin to pray and I, and, I, and, I, and I begin to ask God, God, what are you trying to say to me? Remember what I talk about Isaiah 46, God's big picture and where I fit in? I begin to ask God, God, your heart's desire is to see the whole earth to be filled with God's glory. So where do I fit into that? And the Lord began to speak to me about going to work in church, uh, in, my, in my own church, the Anglican church called Chapel of the Holy Spirit. When God told me to work in church, I was like, oh no, no, this is terrible. You know? At that time, I was earning a very good salary. So I went to investigate my church, uh, what is their starting pay? That was in 1988, right? What was the starting pay? I realized that they didn't have a word called salary. It's called stipend. Starting pay was $600. I was like, why would I want to give up my scholarship and all that I was earning to go work for a company or a church that only pays you 600 bucks? I'm like, this makes no sense. You know, this totally makes no sense. And then, and then I begin to wrestle through and uh, I told my pastor, my pastor told the leadership, the leadership felt so sorry for me, gave me a jump, $630. <laughs> that was a joke. I was like, no way, $630, right? And so, so in there, what, what happened next was uh, I began to, to pray and God spoke to me from this passage. Unless the kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it will produce many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while anyone who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. He said to me, you are like that seed. Once extremely broken, extremely wasted. I took you and I cleansed you and I made you brand new. But I have a purpose and I have a destiny for this seed. If you were to choose to do what you like to do, you would become a very, very beautiful seed. But you will never live the purpose of what this seed is meant to be. But if you're willing to die, promise you that you will produce many seeds and my Father will honour you. I took time to look at my life up to that point. Because of Christ, I have what I have today. Because of Christ, I didn't end off in another direction. Instead, my whole life took a major change. And do I love God? Yes, I do. I really, really love Jesus. How much do I love Him? I look at the scholarship. I said to God, I said, God, the reason why I have this scholarship is because of you. And therefore, this scholarship has no hold on me. So I let it go. And I came into full-time ministry on 1st of July, 1989. This is my 31st year right now. And so, so entering into that, I, I came in and I became the youth pastor of uh, Chapel of the Holy Spirit. I also became the chaplain for St. Andrew's Secondary School. I had some really, really wonderful years and wonderful days in my life. And as I began to serve God out of that, I continued to grow and grow. And as a result, uh, eight years after I worked in church, the Lord said to me, your time in church is up. I'm now calling you to move from church to become a missionary with YWAM. And so after eight years, I thoroughly really enjoyed what I was doing. And, but because I'm now the second highest salaried staff next to my vicar, my, my, my pastor, my senior pastor, and, 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 um, and that was it. You know, I, I kind of like hit the ceiling. And so when God told me to come, become a missionary around in the world, I was so excited because I get to explore, I get to learn something new in there. So when he told me that I was going to join YWAM, um, I was really excited until I found out that uh, YWAM doesn't pay you a salary. I was thinking to myself, wait a minute, why would anyone work for someone without a salary? When I investigate more, I realize that you have to pay YWAM to work for YWAM. This is ridiculous. Why would anybody want to pay for someone to work for someone? And so I said, no, of course no, right? And so, so I, I been, went back to God again, I began to pray, and I said this to God. I said, God, what the heck is wrong with you? What is so wrong with you? Haven't I given up enough? 
haven't I given up enough to obey you? And now, after eight years, I barely got my salary, reconciled with my parents right now, and, uh, and, uh, and I bought a house under my name. I have all these loans that I'm supposed to pay. My parents are retired. I'm caring for them. I'm the sole breadwinner of my family. And at this time, you tell me to give this up and to obey you by becoming a missionary with no salary, with no security. Once again, God takes me into his character. God takes me into who he is. God takes me into his goodness and his faithfulness. And once again, he spoke to me from John chapter 12. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it will produce many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life on, the, on this world will gain it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honour the one who serves me. He said this, Eight years ago, you were a seed. You died, and look at how many thousands of students that you have impacted. Look at how many hundreds of students you have led to Christ and that you have discipled as a result. Look at how much you have reconciled with your own family and how much God has blessed me with this whole thing. Look at what I've done in your life. But now, eight years later, you're still that seed. And once again, I'm asking you to die, but this time I'm asking you to plant you into the nations and you will see what I'm going to do in and through you throughout all the world. I wrestled and I really wrestled and I really wrestled. Long story short, uh, I decided that I will lay that down and I will obey him. He basically asked me this question. For eight years, you have told thousands of students and young people that God is faithful. Do you really believe in those three words? Brothers and sisters, I never knew that being a Christian means that you have to take the faithfulness of God for real and not just words only. Not just a song that you sing, but for real that when he speaks, you can anchor your faith on him. I've learned right now that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, in 1st of August, 1997, eight years later, I quit working in church and I joined YWAM. I've been in YWAM now for about 24 years. When I first joined YWAM, I was like a bit like Nick, young, maybe not as handsome as him, definitely not his size. In there, I thought to myself, okay, la, John Wyvern, single guy, you know, I, I don't think I'll get married. I mean, which Singaporean girl would want to marry a guy without a salary, right, Nick? Nobody would want to marry a girl without a salary. Well, I did, I got married. And then after I got married, I thought to myself, I'll never have kids because it's so expensive to have kids in Singapore. But I did, God blessed me with two kids. So I've been living 24 years now in this journey of learning what it means. All that I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So where have I been? One of my earliest places that I went to is actually India. Spent time working in this slum in India. Now, if you look at this slum, this is the largest slum in Mumbai. It has about uh, one million uh, people living in this slum. One quarter of Singapore's uh, population at that point in time. And uh, this slum, uh, actually you know the slum. If you have watched the movie Slum Dog Millionaire, Diwali, this is the slum that, that, that I went to to do ministry in there. And it was so powerful that it totally shaped me. Uh, after India, I went, I went to work in China. And uh, this is the orphanage that was in China that is somewhat tied to Pastor Derek uh, because here, when Pastor Derek was a pastor in the Church of Our Saviour, uh, one of his members uh, went in to work in this particular orphanage. This orphanage no longer exists right now. And so this is a multi-ethnic uh, group uh, orphanage in there. And I went up there to, to reach out and to support the missionary that was in there. And I brought teams. Uh, many of my team members were actually members from, from KUS, actually. And so, so we went out there and, and, and then to, to, to work with uh, this uh, group of uh, Amish people tribes in there. And one particular trip, the Lord uh, spoke to me about cooking curry chicken. 
and so uh, cook curry chicken for about 250 kids in there. And then uh, what happened was, uh, as we were giving out the food to the children, it was just a very wonderful time. And then the matron gathered the whole school together to, 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 to say thank you to, to us. And while they were saying thank you to us, the Lord sent a rain. And so all of us were dispersed into different classrooms. And I was in a classroom about this size with about 30 students uh, in my classroom. And some of my teammates were with me. And the students came up to me, the orphans came up to me and said, Susu, Susu, And so I, I took out a Chinese song. We sang with them. Then we looked at the lyrics of the song. And then they asked me this question. They say, Susu, Susu, Shui Shi Tian Fu? Who is the Heavenly Father? Now in China, at that time, you're not allowed to preach the gospel to, to young children. And so, but if they ask you a question, you can answer. So they asked me a question, no, Uncle, who is the Heavenly Father? So I told them, and then they said to me, Uncle, do you know the Heavenly Father? Yeah, so I told them. And then they said, Uncle, we don't have a father and a mother. Can we know the Heavenly Father? Of course! As a result, 30 kids came to Christ. And then we, uh, because I, I, I smuggled Bibles, so I, 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 I gave Bibles to the older kids, taught the children how to read the New Testament and I said to them, I will come back six months later. This is May. I will come back six months later and I'm going to show you, I want to teach you what this book is about. Now, during that six months duration, Pastor Derek went to this orphanage and visited the missionary in this orphanage, found out that the matron had a tumour in her head. Typical to Pastor Derek, who believes in the power of healing, prayed for her and Pastor Derek left. She went to the hospital and looked for the tumor. The tumor disappeared. The missionary led her to Christ. But this matron didn't know that 30 children have become Christian. The kids didn't know that the matron has become Christian. Until we arrived in November, we connected them as a result. The church was born. The church was born as a result in there. It's just a wonderful story of, 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 of how God does His work in there. Uh, here is a Tibetan guy. Uh, he's the chief of a son. Uh, he's the son of the chief uh, of a tribe in there. Had the privilege of leading him uh, to the Lord. And this is a work that is in Tibet. Uh, Pastor Derek will be able to recognize. Some of you might recognize some of the members in there because most of them came from Kus actually. And so I let them. And this is a business team whereby we let them to use their business skills to work with the missionary on the field. Uh, this is uh, some of you might think that this is Scotland, but actually this is Tibet. A wonderful, beautiful place in there. And so one of the things that I do whenever I go on a mission trip is to I will bring prayer teams up into the high places and we begin to engage in prayer and stuff like that. And this is the work amongst the Hui Muslims and, and I, because I love to cook, so I will cook and I will serve in there and then I was invited to stay in a, in a mosque. Now when you look at this, you would think that it's a Chinese temple, but actually it's actually a mosque. Uh, it's shaped like a Chinese temple. Uh, they have contextualized Islam uh, in, in China in that way. Then after, subsequently after China, I begin to work in Southeast Asia and Indochina. This is the work in, uh, in Myanmar amongst the tribal people. This is in Papua New Guinea. And uh, we also started a, a, a ship ministry whereby we sail on the river to bring medical care to the unreached people tribe. I had the privilege of leading a chief to the Lord. Uh, and then I uh, also brought teams up into Chiang Rai the work amongst the, the children's home in the, in the hill tribes in China. And this is the work in Nepal, training a group of young people to teach them about youth ministry and how to do youth ministry work. This is the work in Okinawa that, I, that I'm now most recently passionate about and just wanting to equip and to disciple pastors and work alongside with pastors as they start churches in there. So in that 24 years of my time in YWAM, these are the nations that God has taken me to. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that what you're seeing today is a miracle. Because more than 30 years ago, it was not supposed to be like that. My life was really just going down the hill. But it's because of the Lord Jesus, how He met me, how He shaped me, how He tutored me, how He helped me to know who He is. And as a result of knowing who He is, I found out who I am. And as a result of knowing who I am, I realize my call and my destiny in Him. And as I begin to trust Him, He begins to take me into places that I've never imagined that I'll ever be. And this is just in our Asia region. So, knowing God's image 
we will begin to discover our identity and subsequently our destiny in Him. You know, I went into your website and I love your vision statement. To restore identity, wholeness and destiny through intentional discipleship and authentic community. And that's so powerful because as you begin to study about who God is, you will truly know who you are. The question is this, what are you going to do as God reveals that to you? I pray and ask the Lord if there's a word that's apt for us at this point in time. Uh, Psalm 32 verses 8 and 9 comes to mind. You might want to read it together. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you and I will watch over you. Watch this. Do not be like a horse or the mule which has no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. So God is committed to instruct, to teach, to counsel and to watch. But he says this, you cannot be like a wild horse. What is this wild horse? This horse is someone who is so full of himself, full of strength, not broken. And even before the rider says anything, he takes off. He just shoot off and just run very quickly. Just totally driven without a sense of being let. What is a mule? A mule is a crossbreed between a horse and a donkey. A mule is someone that is very, very stubborn. So you seek the Lord for something, God gives you a confirmation, you think, I want one more confirmation. After 20th confirmation, you still want one more. You still wonder if God has spoken to me. God says, if you are so ngang gang, stiff neck, I cannot lead you. If you are like a wild horse, I cannot lead you. So what does he want? God is looking for people who say yes. Yes, on the basis of knowing who he is. Do you know God? Do you know who He is? Because the more you know Him, the more you will say yes to Him. I'll close with this scripture, Isaiah 65 verse 1. Read together with me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. This is God's cry. This is God's longing. God is a proactive God. He didn't wait for me. He came to me and revealed himself to me. God is a proactive God. He didn't wait for a nation to call on him. But he went to that nation and he sought that nation out and revealed himself to him. This is God's big picture. He desired to be made known. His greatest longing and desire is for the whole earth to know him. My question is this, where do you fit? Where do you fit in his passion and his desire? So my last question to you is this. In looking into his image, my question to you is, who defines you? Who defines who you are? Who defines what you do? Seek the Lord and ask him, and he will reveal himself to you. Amen. God bless you.